Welcome to the show. Today, I was privileged to be joined by Stephen Warnock, former professional footballer. Stephen used to play for clubs such as Liverpool, Leeds, Villa, Blackburn. He also played for the England national team and went to a World Cup. I have been coaching Stephen for a few months now, as you'll hear more details of in the show. And he very, very generously agreed to share his story in the hope that it can help you, and maybe other people who are going through similar things. We dig into a lot of stuff. We talk for about an hour. We get into psychological problems and issues throughout Stephen's professional career. We talk about depression. We talk about suicidal thoughts. And we talk about how he's completely transformed his life and overcome those things in the past few months. I absolutely loved this conversation. I hope you do too. Enjoy. So I thought it'd be that interesting to go right back to when we met basically like how did this all start do you know mm. what i mean because i was thinking about it the other day that so we met doing the amphi rap yeah basically with um i remember robbo asking me about doing a, a show that you were going to be invited on so we got to, we got we were sort of getting to know each other through that i think we got on from the start the three of us got on yeah which was nice until and i found out your name was really paul and not copy Oh yeah, remember you telling me that, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Who, who's Paul? I remember Robbo going, so what do you think, Paul? Now, who's who's Paul? he talking to? So what, yeah. what did you think I was just like, Pele? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a one name. Just one name, Beyonce. <laughs> yeah, nice. Um, and yeah, so the but the bit I was thinking about that, like how that led, basically the seeds that led to this, is that back then, and you wouldn't have known this to begin with, but that was when in my life I was starting to change loads of stuff and I'd yeah. started seeing a therapist. And I remember when I first started seeing a therapist, like, you know, proper, like, alpha male from Liverpool and all the rest of it, had a business or, like, just not something we talk about. And I remember being dead embarrassed about it to begin with. Yeah. And then made a conscious decision at one point. Now I'm going to talk about this. Like, I'm going to share it with other people. And I remember it was it was after a show, I think, at one point, and we were t we might have been talking about it on the show, like mental health and yeah. stuff like that. But I remember me, you, and Robbo were talking about ex-pro footballers and the struggles they mm. had and different things. And I remember just sharing with the two of you that I was seeing a therapist, yeah, and and it being like, oh right, okay, that's interesting. And that led to a, a while later. I remember you messaging me saying, "Who's this therapist you're seeing? Like, tell me more about it." Yeah, yeah. So. So I'm interested to know what was what was going on in your life then, because I don't. It's funny this because we've been working together for ages now, yeah, yeah. And I actually don't know the details of that part of your life, that story. Uh, I, th I think when when we were talking about the mental health side of things, I was um, I was having a tough time myself coming out the game. I mean, we'd worked together when I was still playing, and I think everything was all right ish, but I still had problems where I was suffering a little bit. And then when we started speaking about it, I think like you say there. To know that someone else was comfortable talking about it was making me feel like, well, I'd quite like to talk about it myself. And um, I think uh, I'd started seeing a therapist who we both see, uh, Dave Kirk, and we, we'd, we'd spoke to Dave a couple of times. And I remember speaking to you and saying, oh, I've started seeing a guy. And you were like, oh, who are you seeing? And it was Dave. And you were like, oh, I see Dave. And it was almost like straight away, you, again, you've got that something in common and, and an understanding. Um but yeah, I was I was suffering coming out the game of not having stability in my life, as in not having a purpose to wake up for. Like I used to wake up and I'd be like, right, you're in at training at this time. This is what time you've got to be in. This is what you're going to have to eat during the week. This is what you've got to wear to, mm. to come in to, to, to go to a, a game or whatever. It was very much, the only way of describing it is very, it's army-like, it's regimented, but that's what I'm used to. And then I'd switched away from that. And suddenly I was waking up in the morning thinking, where's my day going? What have I got going on in, in the day today? Or when's my next bit of work coming in from the media? Because I'm freelance in the media and I still am. And uh, I'm sure we'll talk about this later on, but there's a, there's a touch of uncertainty as to where work's coming in. And when you've got that uncertainty in your mind, playing on in the back of your mind, you start to build up a negative sort of feeling in behind you. Um, I had issues going on in my private life, which I'm sure we'll talk about again uh, a little bit later on down the line. So, um, yeah, I was I was suffering, but suffering silently, I suppose. Um, and I was I was actually looking through my phone before. You were probably thinking I was being quite rude and texting people, but I was looking through to uh, to look at the date when I first texted you for help. 
uh, and it was uh, what was it January thirteenth? Uh, sorry, yeah, January thirteenth uh, this year to say I'm in a rut. I need help. Um, but I knew you were you were on that path of coaching people. You'd been there yourself because you've you've spoke about it on podcasts and in your books and things like that. And I just felt like I needed someone else who'd been in the shit, basically, who knew how to get out of it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and going back to like lifestyle before, for anyone who doesn't know, like you were in you were in the game as a as a footballer. Yeah, from a very young age, weren't you? Like when when well, did from, that start? From the age of ten. From the age of ten, when I first started going to Liverpool, I knew I was at Liverpool on a Tuesday and a Thursday night. I'd play a game on a on a Sunday. So that was my schedule, but like I knew I had school every day. So again, it comes down to that. Where are you going to be? What are you going to wear? Well, I was going to school at eight or half eight in the morning. I was wearing a uniform. I'd finish at half three. I'd walk home from school. I'd probably get in around my my house around between four and half four. And this sounds like daft, but I can still picture it now. Yeah. I knew everything that I was doing. Then on a Tuesday and a Thursday, I'd get the train to Old Drone. I'd get picked up by my auntie. My auntie would take me to Melwood. She'd take me training if my mum and dad couldn't do it. So I knew my schedule. That was in my head straight away. But I'd done that from the age of 10 up until 35, 36, whenever I retired. Because did you go straight from, what, what did you go like 16 from school? Straight, straight 15. Into yeah, 15. Time. As soon as you finish, I think we had two or three weeks off because the season, obviously, you, you think about when you finish your GCSEs, well, the footy season starts pre-season July. So you didn't go back in September when the new school year starts. You went back in July. Mm -hmm. So a two-week period of being off and then straight into it. Yeah. And then it's been full tilt ever since leaving school from the age of 15. And I had big setbacks when I was a youngster that I had to overcome as well. Broke my leg three times. And psychologically, I look back on that now and think, Jesus, like what a mad time that was. But they're all little things that I've played into it. But yeah, from, from the age of basically... 15 of coming out of school till the, till the retirement age, it's been pretty much full on knowing exactly what you're doing and where you're at. And I would guess as well, like when I talked before about, you know, being brought up as an alpha male in a very like, you know, male focused, um, like alpha male city yeah, society where this is, this is starting to change now a little bit. Still, still not in huge ways. I don't think, and this is part of us talking about this stuff publicly. I think um, that was Joey just in a normal life. I can imagine in a football environment where it's mainly just males together. Yeah, what was that like? Because even going back to when you did things like broke your leg. Yeah, was there any like psychological support? Was there, was there any way where you thought you could go and talk about stuff? No, and and I think just going back a tiny bit more the big thing for me was w what was difficult and i've only reflected on this since we've been doing the work was i'm not a scouser i'm from Ormskirk. i'm seen as an outsider yeah so when i stepped into the changing room at liverpool i was the non-scouser in the changing room i was the one who didn't fit in and i always found that difficult to, to to be one of the lads or to be someone even when people talk about me in the media now i'm i'm not a liverpool I'm not from Liverpool, so I'm not deemed as one of their own. Mm. I'm deemed as the lad slightly outside, but just the nothing. Yeah. Um, and that was always difficult in the changing room to, to come to terms with that. I always felt like I was trying to be accepted within the changing room. And um, even when I look back on my career now, I think that part of my life, rather than just standing up to it and going, no, I deserve to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm as good, if not better than all you. Whereas now I look at it and think, God, I wish I'd have gone down that road. But when I look at the way my career path went, I was almost trying to feel accepted in every club that I went to. Never felt part of things or never felt like, the only place I felt like the main man was Blackburn or one of the main men because I was I felt so important to the club. But that was the way the manager felt, made me feel, the way the club made me feel. Um, but then when I did get injured, psychologically, I just dealt with things myself. Uh, we've spoke about it before where I, I had an insurance claim. I think I got around about seven to nine grand in and around that fee. Just went out and got pissed because I didn't know how to deal with it. Mm. I, I was fine at first. And then I was like seeing all the lads going out to training every single day. And I was like, this is tough. This is getting hard now. And then I just started going out, getting pissed. And then one night, one, one of the lads turned around to me and he was like, what are you doing? 
aren't you meant to be a footballer? And I was like, yeah, yeah. And he was like, well, you're overweight for starters. And I remember st stood there and I was like, I literally put my bottle down there and then. And I was like, oh, I'm done. She went home and then thought, right, I need to get fit, need to get stronger. Um, and uh, yeah, that that was only for me wake up call was someone being honest with me, not being like a yes man and going, yeah, you'll be sound, you'll be all right. I could have gone down the route of so many other lads who, who play football and don't make it. How old were you then? Uh, probably 19, 18 or 19. So I was like at the point where I was just getting fit, but I would never have been fit, mm. if you get what I mean. Yeah. I was getting fit physically in my injury, but I wouldn't have, never have been fit enough to run around the footy pitch and, and to, to be in a, in a decent shape. And I guess as well back then, like the, in that time, because what's that, 20 years ago? Yeah. Like the world's changed a lot, probably in and inside and outside the football. Massively. Like hugely. Mm. So back then, was it very much just like old school, just get on with things? It, it is what it, it is what a lot of people say now. Like you listen to mental health and we talk about, about it so much. But there's so many people now who go, well, we were just told to get on with it, man up. That was that was what the thing. Grow up, get on, get on with it. Mm. But we're taught that from such a young age with our parents and things and uh and people in and around us. It's not deemed the right thing to to be upset about something. That's that's a sign of weakness. Whereas I think now we know that's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of like, I need a little bit of help here. I almost need someone to put their arm around me and help me a little bit. And I think I had a lot of that when I was when I was a youngster. Um and it's it's funny when even when I talk about stuff like this now, because of the work we've done, like I know I suppressed all that. So I know that feeling now of like it was like, don't admit it. Just put that away for a for a bit longer and just leave that and it'll just go away. Mm. And you're like, you don't realise the damage it's gonna have on you long term. Um, so they're little things obviously we've worked on and learned, but now when I look back on it, you just think, what was I thinking? Um, and I think if I was to come into football now in the era we're in, uh, I was fortunate enough that I'd worked with psychologists later on in my career. Um, sort of when I went to Blackburn and, and Villa a little bit. And then when I went to Wigan, we had one who, who, who ended up going to Liverpool as well, Lee Richardson. And, um, working with them guys was when I was at my peak like when I felt great and I felt like everything I was going to do on a football pitch was going to work, everything away from it was great. But the bits where I didn't work with someone was where I struggled massively. Um, so if I was to come into football now and start, like I speak to, to lads who, who are my mates and who work at clubs and they're working with like under 13s to 15, 16 year olds and they've got psychologists, they've got people to speak to. If they need to go and speak to someone, they can go and speak to them. And I think that's brilliant. Yeah. I mean, we could we could go down a rabbit hole just talking about that yeah. the whole time, couldn't we? I, it still amazes me to this day that like even Liverpool only appointed a psychologist a year or so ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To me, that's just insane. Like that, that every pro, not just footballer, but every pro, I mean, I, I you know what I'm like, I'm, and I'm biased, but I think every human should have a therapist, a coach, both, yeah. as many people as you can support you. For elite sports people to not have that when so much is psychological just blows my mind. I think a lot of them probably have used them. But again, it's that I'm not going to tell anyone I'm using them because it's like, is it, a, is it a weakness or is it, I don't want anyone to know the edge that I'm getting over other people. Yeah, And I think that's something that played into it a bit. But now I think, there was a lot made, wasn't there, of uh, of England using uh, psychologists. What's the guy who did the the, the Chimp Paradox book? Uh, Steve Peters. Steve Peters. And he was talked about a lot, wasn't he? And suddenly it became the in thing to do and people wanted to use them. But just very quickly, when I went to Blackburn and we used a psychologist, Jameel was like someone who was, was incredible for me, really helped me uh, change my game, my approach to the way you'd look at a football match and the way you'd prepare for it and the feeling that you need to give yourself going into a game. But he had to approach the lads in a certain way. So Jamil's background was he went to uh, went to university with Darren Brown mm. and it was Darren Brown went down the TV route of being a specialist in mind tricks and things like that, whereas Jamil wanted the sports psychology or the psychology of, of working in workplaces. So his way in at Blackburn was to to almost put on a little bit of a show and to take watches off people's wrists to to do little tricks on them. And the lads were like, oh, this guy's great. Yeah. 
And then he had an in with them because they were like, yeah, I like him. But it, if he hadn't have done that, I think he might have got two or three on board. But when he did these tricks and people saw what the, the type of person he was, suddenly he pulled everyone in and everyone wanted to sit down, talk to him. And I think that was part of it. That was was important for him as well. I remember you telling us about that a while ago. And I, and I love that approach, like to, to break down the barriers to get people. In. It's a little bit like without doing magic tricks, do you know what I mean? When, when I talk to people about this stuff, like yeah. try and get it away from the either woo-woo like stuff that people are like, oh, I don't like that, especially lads. Yeah, yeah. Or like the like uber scientific stuff that just bores people and like and try don't and find. Understand. And don't get, yeah, mm. and just confuses yeah. them. But interesting on that to tie back into something we are talking about before is presumably what he focused on and when you had those patches was sports performance. Is that right? Rather than sort of whole life. Yeah, it was. And I think that's the the big thing was when I went into the training ground or went to a game, I was preparing my mind for that moment. And that was what we were working at. Mm. And it was little things like even, but it was all related off the pitch as well. So it was eating the right foods. So I had, I had this big thing in my head and I, I still laugh at it now. I used to weigh 77.8 kilograms. And I had to wake up on a Friday morning at that weight the day before a game. If I was under it, I'd be happy. If I was over it, my mind would race. How am I going to lose this weight today? How am I going to make sure that I am ready for the game tomorrow? Because I knew if I went in at 77.9 or 80, on that Saturday morning warming up for the game, I'd be thinking, you're overweight. I'd beat myself up. Not thinking, you've been, you've done everything right all week. You're powerful, you're strong, your mentality is right. You've done everything within your power to be right. But that 0.2 of a kilogram overweight, that's unacceptable. And that would play on my mind. That would be on my mind. So I'd like get to Friday morning and if I'd hit that weight, if I'd hit 77.7, it was like a party in my head going off. It was like, brilliant. You're going to be flying tomorrow. But that 0.1, 0.2 over, that would ruin me completely. So it was little things like that, making sure that you were prepared for how to deal with little situations like that. But then I'd just make sure that I was never over that weight because I knew that I, I couldn't deal with it any other way. And did, did you, because that, it's funny because that ties into the, all the work we've done, yeah, yeah. doesn't it? Like mm -hmm. the stories, where, like where did that story, that's so specific, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Like where did that story come from for you that that's the weight you had to be or under? I think I'd just played a good game at that weight. Okay, yeah. And it's like when people say, oh, what's the, uh, what's your superstitions? I'll, I'll pull me right sock on before me left one. I'll put yeah. me left boot on before me right one. Well, where does that come from? Mm. It all comes from that one game that you remember. Not the, the the 72 before it where you've played well as well or you've had even better games, but something just stuck in your mind where, okay, that's the way to have to be. Um, it was even little things like even the, it was strange because even my body fat, I didn't care whether that fluctuated because I thought, well, as long as I'm 77.8, I'm fine. Um, but you just, you, you do, you go back to that one moment, which is in your mind that you think of, I had a great game at that weight. So if I can stay at that weight, I'll play well all the time. It's the, this, this is the bit <clears throat> that fascinates me. So did, did you do any work with the psychologist at that time, like to release you from that in any way? Because something I think about this, do the work we do and we'll, we'll get onto, you know, back into you know where you were when you started and, and where where you've ended up now yeah but for me like i was thinking about this just watching the snooker a few weeks ago that most sports like people who are elite sports people mm. they can do the thing they need to do yeah. at the highest level like if you take a golfer under no pressure or a snooker player under no pressure and say you know just put, do that just put this 10 yeah. foot put in or just pot this difficult part they'll do it like yeah. 99 times out of 100. And the difference is the pressure of the of what's going on. And we'll we'll dig into this more, but do, do, you know the this, this stuff we've focused on. For me, it's all about, well, what's the pressure? The pressure is missing. The pressure is failing. Mm. And what does that mean? And I, I, I've, I'm, I'm interested, like, going forward, whether this work, and I believe it could, can just remove that completely from sports people. And mm. generally in life, this is, this is not just for sports people. Yeah. This is for everybody. And it, as you tell that story, I think, I wonder what I wonder what your performance would have been like if back then you could have had that taken from you, that pressure. Oh, so was there any of, the, was 
Was there any of that work going on at the time? To a certain degree there was, but we if I'd have sat down with him probably two or three times a week, then I think you'd have got to that point. But he had other jobs on. He had other work with like the England cricket team and golfers and things like that. So we might only seen him two times a month or something like that. Okay. So it was almost like a, right, let's get a quick fix. And let's work on the, the here and now rather than the longer term. Um, and and I think if we'd have, if we'd have worked on that, then you would have seen a big difference. The, the one that sprung to mind straight away when I, when I, when you spoke then was, I think of Usain Bolt, and he goes chicken nuggets before a final in the Olympics. Yeah. Why? Because he trusts himself, and he knows he's good enough. It's not about anything else. Mm. It doesn't matter to him in his mind. I'll have eaten chicken nuggets before a race. He's just thinking. It doesn't matter what I put in my body. I'm going to beat you all anyway. Such is that self-belief in himself. Whereas if I'd have had chicken nuggets, I'd have been thinking, oh, I'm struggling here. In my mind, Yeah, I'd have beat myself up thinking, you can't do what you need to do here at eating chicken nuggets. And he's just thinking, I'm all right. I can do that comfortably. And it's that self-belief again. And that's the mentality you do see of certain people. Like often people will say, why didn't it such and such make it to a certain level? It's not their ability. It's mm. the mentality. It's the it's that beating themselves up in the brain and and things like that. So uh, I think it, if I'd have found that side of things, then yeah. But it ties into the 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 not being accepted as well. In my head, I always thought you're not accepted, so you're always fighting that battle. There's so many battles going on in your head that you don't even realise you're fighting, and I've only realised them what two three months. Well, the last few months. Yeah. Well, for, pe for people who don't know, like if they're not watching this at the time, we're recording this in June 2021. Yeah. Yep. I don't even know what year it is anymore. <laughs> so so five months-ish, yep. like we've been talking to each other doing this work. So, but to, to cover a point on that, actually, before we before we go into sort of the end of your career and, and where this properly started then, something I want to touch on, and this, this is something I'll talk about a lot in the future, I think, and potentially controversially, is... Is the is what you know, in the wider equality debate, sexual equality thing? Because mm. one of one of my bugbears is it, it's almost when we talk about equality, there's the sort of a, something I talk about in, in the new book is silent implications. There's almost the silent implication that being a man mm. is just dead easy. And it, one of the problems with that is like if you've not been a man, you don't understand the struggles of being a man. And even just saying this out loud, you, I can imagine people going, "Oh, as if you have any struggles being a man." And this for me is one of the key ones. And I've only noticed this because I've been doing this work for about three years now on myself and then and then coaching other people. And I've only sort of realized that, when you talk about like that going into a dressing room surrounded mm. by other alpha males yeah. in an environment where you don't feel like you fit in, there is a very strong, and I don't like the word banter generally, but it, you have to use that word a lot of times, a very strong like banter culture amongst men, yeah. especially in these types of cities, and Liverpool is not alone in this, but the you know the dynamics between men we've always had growing up is very much a take the piss out of each other. Yeah, yeah. And something I've noticed actually only only through because you mentioned before about suppressing emotions, and that's something mm. we we've worked loads on. And it's only since I've sort of reopened my emotions in recent years that I've started realizing that loads of the time when I'm involved in piss taking or banter, me doing it to other people or them doing it to me, actually. It's hurt, like it's hurting my feelings. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Someone will say something to me and I think, God, that, that actually really cut me deep inside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But as a man, you could never, like, I, I often laugh at this, that like, imagine being in a pub and saying to one of your mates, you just really hurt my feelings. Mm. Like, I just can't even, even now after doing all this work, I can't picture like that scene. No. And that's how we end up having fights and things because anger takes over from the hurt and stuff. Yeah. Do you, when you look back now at that period, having done the work you've done was there an element of that as well when especially when you're younger trying to fit into that crowd yeah all the time uh you walk in every day and no matter what you're wearing clothes wise someone will pick on it because we've all got different styles different tastes and that was something that people would struggle with every day you'd see lads going in with the most basic clothes on but they didn't want to like I look at Calvert Lewin now, Dominic Calvert Lewin and Tom Davis, and I just think, good on yous. Yeah. Just extroverts who who were their personalities. And even since we've started doing this work, I'm not probably dressed in like the best thing today, but 
I wear different clothes now. I wear things that I wouldn't usually have worn because I'd be fearful of what people thought. Whereas I, I'd like pick a trainer up and I'd go, I really like them. It's funny, a couple of weeks ago, I think I told you this, uh, I bought a pair of like yellow night, black and yellow night trainers. And I remember like walking to meet my mates and I had them on with a pair of black jeans, but I thought, no, I like them. I'm happy with them. And one of them went, oh, stay to them. And I went, you don't have to wear them. And he like looked at me like, didn't know what to say. And I was like, well, I like them. He was like, well, okay then. Just, he didn't yeah. know what to say back. <laughs> he didn't have anything back. Yeah, I love it. And um, it, it is that side of things. Like I, I look around town now and I think we've come so far. Would you ever, four or five years ago, seeing a lad wearing an Alice band in town? Being no unacceptable yeah, in Liverpool? No chance. no chance would you have seen that. Hmm. Not, not at all. Would you have seen a skateboard culture that we've got around Liverpool? You wouldn't. No. It'd have been like, what are you, what are you doing? That's not like, again, that masculinity, like, like the masculinity side of things. What you go now, you look at it and go, it's brilliant. I love how many different like variations you see. Like, it sounds like you've just like woke up in a different world, but like you go, it's boss to see. Yeah, it's great because you're seeing people's personalities, and I'm trying to teach my kids that now. Is like be yourself. Wear what you're comfortable wearing. And if someone doesn't like it, don't worry about it because they're not wearing it. They don't, they didn't choose to wake up in the morning and wear it. You wore it because it felt right for you and you feel comfortable in it. But don't walk around wearing it and going, oh, everyone's looking at me here. Just wear it and get on with it. And I think that's the side of it where, again, I've got used to, but going back into your, into the je- dressing room, I think there was a, a bit of a, I hope I don't get hammered here walking in and the thing is though I'll have done it to people as well Yeah, I'll have hammered people because I wanted to be part of the crowd and you want to feel like you fit in and that's the other side of things as well yeah well and for people who are watching this and, and don't like don't know the very basis of like the work we do and the work I've done and what I help other people do now is all built on self-worth and yeah. so when when you share stories like that and other people share stories with that, like that I love them like I always say to people the small things are the big things and yeah, yeah. those for me are they just the we said this at the time when you told me that story, like that example to me is just such an amazing example of how your self-worth is just, is now fine. Mm. Cause it's like, now I just feel good enough as I am. I was, I haven't seen you since then, but I, we had a family party a couple of weeks ago and one of my sister's mates was there who I've known for like 20 years and she was sitting next to me and she looked around the room and she went to me, sister, I love the way your whole family gets dolled up, even though it's like just, you know, a party in the house. Yeah. And then she looked at me and went, Apart from your brother, because <laughs> I, I was just sitting there dressed like this, t-shirt and jeans, and Are I was you comfortable. Like, I'm all right. Yeah. Why do I need to get dressed up to impress anyone? Yeah. I'm just sitting here. Well, that that same day, I think you, uh, I, I told you about it, but there was a guy like me and my daughter like love Marvel, yeah. like love it. Yeah. Think, like we're on like a Marvel thing at the moment where we're try- trying to get through all the films, and there was this uh, there was this like gay couple sat opposite, and one of the guys had a Marvel top on, and I remember walking across to the bar, and I just went, "Nice t-shirt, mate." And he was like, oh, thanks. Like, but he was like, gen- but I was like genuinely like, I'd wear that. Like, I, I, I really would wear that. And even yesterday I was in uh, Blackpool uh, Pleasure Beach with the kids and I seen loads of people walking around on the Marvel tops and I was like, oh, I wish I had one on. They're great. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just like little things like that. But I could tell that even when I said that to the guy, he was like made up. It felt good that, he, he, someone had like appreciated like he was wearing something different as well and that was yeah I think that's something that we've we've spoke about as well absolutely yeah absolutely I love all that and so let's let's jump back in and and we should have said before I start actually like obviously only share as much as you're comfortable sharing so go Joe, going to the end of the career and when when we met and we talk about therapy and stuff like that because I, I openly share now and this is in the, the new book and stuff yeah my story of you know and for me it was similar and we've we've often talked about this like how i'm not i wasn't a professional footballer but very similar paths very similar backgrounds very similar life lives and expectations and things and i got to a point where to the outside world like i just looked like i had the perfect life like Mm. the life that you would anybody would sort of instagram life yeah 100 percent instagram life and um at that i always think like if you charted it at the peak of like my parents being proud of me and the world being like, he's nailed it, was also the peak of my depression. Yeah. Like I was literally, this full story's in the book, but I I was literally like plotting my own death. Mm. I'd sit in my 
city centre offices of the law firm I'd built. Mm. You know, with I had multiple houses, a flash car, beautiful wife, big city centre apartment, huge clients that like big law firms would be like, how did, they would literally say to me, how have you got those clients? Yeah. And I'm sitting there on a Sunday drinking wine by myself, thinking about how I could how I could get myself killed so it wouldn't look like suicide. Mm. And I look back and think how dark that was, like yeah, that yeah. spell. So what where and I as again share as much as you're comfortable sharing. When you were sort of got to the end of the career, you come out of it, what was it like? What what did it feel like? Empty. Um like Again, you don't have a purpose and you don't know what's next. And, and it's, it's scary, if I'm being completely honest, because you go, well, I've just had like this this football career, which had, 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 it had fallen away towards the end and I knew it had. And that was tough as well, mm. where I was thinking, without making excuses, I knew I should have had an operation the year I went to the World Cup on my ankle. But I was like fearful of being out for like four or five months because I thought, oh, I just want to play. Like, I'm going to lose so many games here, but if I'd have had the operation, it'd have been great. It'd have helped me career going forward. But anyway, I was always picking up niggling injuries. I was never uh, at the peak where I was when I was at Blackburn or like to the start of Villa and things sort of uh, weren't great. And then when I finished my career, I, I just remember sitting back thinking, that was shit. Like, that didn't go the way it should have gone. Like, I, I, I remember thinking like, You've you've wasted so much there, and there was so much more you could have give in in the in, in your yeah, career in, in generally. Career. So for for people listening and watching who who don't know, like this, you're a professional footballer who played for Liverpool, Blackburn, Leeds, Aston Villa, like so, so huge football clubs. You played for England. Yeah, you went to a World Cup. Yeah. So this is like the 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 pinnacle yeah, of professional sports. Yeah, yeah, and that's how you felt after. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And but it's interesting when I speak to other players now who've retired. They they feel the same feel like it passes you by really quick. And I know people say that. They go, it'll be gone, it'll be gone in the blink of an eye. And it it was. It really was. There's parts of my career I can't even remember. Just in a haze. Literally in a haze. And again, I think that's probably little things that now, if I'd have known that, you work on things and you'd you'd be able to take moments in better. Um, but yeah, I, I just remember looking back thinking that was... I, I'd only remembered really the end of my career rather than the great bits in between. And you focus on what's just happened. Mm. You never go way back and think, no, nah, it was brilliant, man. You just think of the, how it's ended and, and why it's ended. Um, but I remember going into the, the media career thinking like, this is interesting. It was something that sparked something in me, but I still had that sort of side of me where, again, wanting to fit in in the media, how can you say that? You've just been playing in the Championship and League One. You can't slag off Premier League footballers. Well, I'm not slagging them off. I'm trying to be constructive and do it in a certain way. And I remember um, sitting down with people and they were like, no, you've been to a World Cup. You've been part of an England team. You've played for England. You've played in the Champions League. You've played in the Premier League. Your opinion's valid. Not many people can have that opinion because they haven't done what you've done. And I remember thinking, like taking a bit of confidence from it, but even still, you're, you're a bit cautious of the way you are. And um, it, it's probably taken me till we started doing this work to really just get on with things and go, yeah, that is the right way to be. Um, and I think it's made me a better a better pundit, a better analysis uh, of, of what I'm doing now. Um, it makes me better in the, in the work that I do constantly. But um, yeah, it was it was tough to to uh, again to to not know what was coming in the media. I chose to be freelance because I liked I liked the I liked the unknown. I thought I did because I liked the well. I could be here next week and I could be here and I might be doing that. Who knows? But that was all coming from the outside. And people saying to me, it's great, isn't it? The unknown. I was like, yeah, yeah. But in my head, I'm probably like, when I think back on it now, I'm thinking, no, I want what I had in football. I want security. I want to know on Saturday, you've got a game. And I know on Tuesday or Wednesday, you've got a game. And on Monday, you're going to be working on Sky. I want to know I've got them things mm. because then my routine can be worked around that. 
and that was the, the very, very difficult thing to learn uh, and, to, and to deal with as well. The other side of things, which a lot of people will, they might turn their nose up at this comment, the checkbook stops, the checks stop coming in, the pay packets. Now, it doesn't matter how much you've earned in your career or how little you've earned. Suddenly, if you don't start getting money paid in, you're thinking, what's my worth here? Where am I going with my life? And you start working, <clears throat> start changing things in your head as to, I've got to go out and earn money now and, and work for this. Whereas, don't get me wrong, you worked for it in football, but you were either on a one or a four or a five year deal. You knew what you were getting paid. Yeah. You knew you had that security behind you. Whereas now in the media, you could be sacked for one bad comment. That's your do that's you done in your career. Mm. And people don't realise that. There's one com you're one comment or one sentence away from never working in the media again. And that's where you've got to be so careful. Whereas you make a mistake in football, you've got another game to rectify it. You can put it right. And and that's the difference. In, and it might not be at that football club, it might be at another one, but you're still getting other opportunities. And that was something as well where I was always very wary of. And I, and listen, I've made mistakes in the media. I've said things. And wow, did I beat myself up to the point where I didn't want to work again. I'm thinking people are just going to be laughing at me and things like that. And then you start reading social media and you're thinking, Oof, this is a minefield. What have I done here? I, I didn't sleep. I didn't sleep for months over some things I've done and said and things like that. So, yeah, that was that was difficult. And so th the things that jump out as, as we're talking, is it, it sounds like, did you feel lost? Is that is that like a, a good yeah, way yeah. to use for that sort of spell? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Not knowing what 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 direction you're going in, um, no one there to almost guide you in a direction as well. It's very. Um, th there's people who want to help you in the media. If you go and find it, if you go and ask people, they'll they'll help you. They'll direct you. But even little things like trying to find a media agent, I've never done this before. Uh, I'd never done accounts or invoices. I was like filling forms out and I was like, I've never done this before. I don't know what I'm doing here. Mm. Like everyone used to do that for me or I'd just get sent a pay packet and then I'd send me, me stuff to the, the accountant and, and that'd be it. Whereas now it was like, oh, can you send over your invoices? I was like, uh, yeah. I was petrified. I didn't know what to do. Again, didn't sleep. I was thinking, I don't know what I'm doing here, but I'm not going to turn around to them and say, uh, sorry guys, I haven't got a clue what I'm doing because I didn't want to feel like an idiot. Yeah, which goes back to the, 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 this is the thing it always comes back to, isn't it? And as you're talking about in the dressing room and then moving into the media, it's that feeling of I'm not good enough, yeah, basically. Yeah, of course. Like ultimately at the deep level, I'm not good enough. And this yeah. is this is what all this work is based on. And that was one of my big revelations through yeah. my stuff is like, mm. to the outside world, you look like this dead confident, cocky, yeah, of course. everything's sorted. And actually deep inside, you're like, I'm just trying to prove myself all the time. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Which is interesting. Do, do, do you think in that time, were you depressed? Would you would you describe Massively. it as that? Massively. Um, I'm going through a divorce at the moment, uh, split up with my wife. And that was, again, something that was going on behind the scenes of that. That was very difficult. And uh, I didn't handle that well at all. As in, I didn't handle the situation with my ex well at all. It was, it was a mess. Uh, I hold my hands up to it with my fault and whatever. But then... I had issues where I wasn't seeing my kids and things like that. And that absolutely destroyed me. So I'm, I'm in, I'm in a flattened town, sat there, not seeing my kids, crying my eyes out for days. And then suddenly switch the telly on, on Sky. I've got to put on a different act. I've got to put on a different persona or I'm on the radio and people are like, they don't see what's just been happening 10 minutes ago. Yeah, They don't see you curled up on a ball on you on your couch, crying your eyes out, thinking I haven't seen my kids for however long and we're in a lockdown. That was tough as well. And you're thinking, like, what's the route out of this? And the route was to get out completely. And like, I spoke to you about it where you go, well, I planned everything. I knew my route out. I knew how I was going to do it, when I was going to do it. And I remember thinking, like, there's got to be another way. Like, I don't know why, but... I remember there was one time when I was like driving down the motorway and I was thinking, this would be an easy way out. And I was on the phone to me, my sister-in-law and she was like, don't you fucking dare. And I was like, 
I remember thinking like, I, I pulled over and like calmed myself and then just went, right, I'm fine, don't worry, I'll be fine. And she was like ringing me constantly after that. And then I planned it another way. And then that's when I sent you the message and said like, oh, I've been listening to you. I, I almost prodded you. I remember, uh, I've got it here, where I said, uh, what did I say to you now? So I said, um, just listen, uh, Fate, just listen to the podcast um, on it because you just don't want about Fate. Mm. Uh, would love to do a session on this. Also need to, uh, you, you also need to get your podcast up and running again. And then you put, uh, that's great, mate. I'm sitting here in the middle of writing a new book all about it. I've actually written the Fate thing. Um, and then you said, what session do you mean? And then I just put, I'm completely lost, mate. Finding life very difficult at the moment. And that was on, that was the 13th of January. And uh, I don't think, if, I think if I hadn't have sent that message, I probably wouldn't have been sat here now. Yeah. So. It's powerful, mm. that, mate. Yeah, yeah. No, so thank was, you. Uh, and thank you for sharing it. Like, it takes yeah. a lot, it takes a lot of courage to talk about stuff like this. And I, this is one of the reasons, and I was really grateful for you offering to share your story, is because, especially for men, Mm. And men with our background, as we've been talking about, and men with your profile, yeah, you know, as we've said, ex pro football, highest level, international. Let me groin there. Sorry, <laughs> that, that's why you have to quit footy. Yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> Just pull me groin sitting on the couch. <laughs> that's like me. Um, and you, you, and you know, now you're on TV, and as you say, you're on. And this is one of my one of the things I really dislike about the world we live in, and the and the societies we've created, which again is in the book, and I'll and I'm going to talk more and more about. As, as the months progress is just this, it's, as you said before, which I think is a great way to put it, like the Instagram life. Yeah, yeah. Like this perception that just because someone's on telly or just because someone looks like their their life is nice or, mm. and, and we're, we're all guilty of creating this world because it's really hard to share this stuff. So people want to say my life's good because everyone else's life looks good. Yeah. And as you're saying, even I remember when you, it's interesting you've, you've read those messages. I don't think I've ever told you this. I remember when you sent me that message, I didn't know what you meant. I, I thought you meant like you wanted to do a session like me and you go and speak to footballers or something. And, <laughs> and that's why I said, like, what do you mean? And yeah, when, yeah. when you were like, oh, I'd, I'd like you to coach me. Like, I'd like to 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 do the work. I was like, oh, right. Because we knew each other, but I didn't. I had no idea how dark life had become for you yeah, until. Yeah. So that's the point we start we start working together. Well, I, I remember our first session, like our first therapy session. And I remember came on the, uh, we, we were doing it obviously over Zoom because it was a, uh, we were in lockdown. And I remember coming on and you just went, oh, you look like shit. <laughs> I'm thinking <laughs> this is an helping. <laughs> but it was, it was that you, you look down, you look bad. Um, and that was like, even then you were like, you don't look yourself. But it, it was to the point where, Again, when you go on the telly or you're doing podcasts and things like that, you've got to change. It's almost like a split personality where you go, right, get upbeat now. Give give the people what they they know and yeah. what they expect. Put the mask on. Put the yeah, exactly. On. And that was the way it was. But when I went on that call with you, I was probably at my worst and my most vulnerable. And I was like, oh, you need to see me like this because I'm in a bad way. It, you know what's dead interesting about that? The, the number of people I've worked with now, and this would apply to me if I look back, I often laugh now with Dave, the Dave Kirk, the therapist we've both used about, because I've been seeing him for three years. Mm. And I was just chatting to him the other day and we were laughing about like the first sessions I had with him compared to what I'm like now. And it, this would have applied to me. I often say to people, if I could take, if I wish I'd have had like a photo of that first session yeah, compared to a photo of you five months later. You video all the calls, don't you? I might have a video of that first one Probably actually. Do, yeah. So I'll, I'll have to go back and, and see yeah. because it, it's like seeing two different people. Yeah. Even talking to you now, and and I know what that feels like. Like I feel it inside myself of the work I've done. Mm. Like just that complete comfort yeah. in your in yourself compared to what it was like before. Yeah, yeah. So it's a good point to, to jump into what, what I suppose what what made you think that the doing this stuff and well, a better question. What did you think you were getting into when you contact? Because that comment you say, and I, I often say to people, like the work I do, I, I still have this now. Loads of people will say to me, you're a life coach. And it makes my skin crawl because in my head, the story I have about life coaches is, it's all about like, everyone smile more and everyone tell yourself you love yourself and everyone yeah, tell yeah. yourself you're beautiful. And I'm like, it doesn't fucking work. It's bullshit. No. 
And because the work I do, and it'd be interesting to get your perspective on this, I actually think it's quite dark. Yeah, it like is. loads of the stuff is dark. It's it's not like for the faint-hearted. It's and it's it's yeah. complete stripping back of bullshit. Well, I, I remember when when we first spoke, you went, "This is going to be tough," and you're going to have to accept that this is going to be horrible, and you're going to cry. You're going to tell me things that you've got to tell. Like you're going to have to open up on everything. And I just remember thinking, well, if I don't commit to this, then I'm a goner anyway. So I may as well give everything uh, and throw myself into it. But I, the reason it came about was because of your podcast mm. and your YouTube stuff that you'd done. And I'd listened to you and uh, obviously because I knew you. So I wanted to see like what, what you were doing. And I was out running and walking a lot over lockdown and I was suffering and I knew I was suffering. But when I was listening to you, I was thinking, he's turned his life around. He's been through, like we 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 said earlier on, similar lifestyles in different professions, but we'd done the same things. We'd been at the same level, the same highs, the same lows. And I was thinking, and he's dead happy. And um, I don't know if you remember it. There was the night in Mar Boyles when I got off the train at like half 10 at night and you were like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, I live in town now. And we went and had a pint. And yeah. I remember you just said to me, and it was something that stuck with me, was don't find, you, you'll you never find complete happiness. Just be content. And you said to me, I'm content. And I always thought, what's he on about? And I, I always remember thinking it. And then I think it was one of the calls that we had. I just remember saying to you, I'm content. Like, I know I'm not going to be happy a hun- like a 100% of the day. I'm going to wake up some days where I feel like shit. There's no reason for it. I can't explain it. No one can. But what I know, what I know is that that'll disappear at some point in the day. I'm not going to beat myself up about it all day. And uh, there's going to be highs and lows in a day, and it's how you deal with them. But now when I look at it, I just go, I am dead content. I'm dead happy. I'm happy where I'm at in life. I'm happy with, look back on my career now and I go, it was brilliant. It was really good. Whereas when I'd finished my career, I was thinking it was shit. Whereas I look back on it now and go, no, you've done well. Do you realise what you you overcome at the beginning to, to get to that level? What, what you've actually achieved? Uh, I look at what I've done in the media in the last three years or so, three, four years. I'm like... I mean, this is, what What are we on today? We're on the 3rd of June, Thursday, the 3rd of June. I don't mind if you if I tam, like time stamp it there. No, but good. on Sunday, I'm working on my first England game, commentating on my first England game. Like, I'm so excited about that. Can't wait. If you'd have said at the start of me finishing my, uh, like starting my media career, like in three, four years, you're going to be commentating on an England game. I'd have gone, no chance. Or... Yeah, I will, but like being cocky, cocky about it. Yeah. Whereas now I look at look at it and go, well, you're achieving things that other people haven't achieved and, and might never achieve. Um, so my my career now is has changed hugely. I, I remember we spoke about it on on one of one of our therapy sessions where you said, I've noticed a difference on when you're on telly or when you're when you're on the radio. The voice, the sound in your voice has changed. Uh, your body body language has changed completely. You, you look confident in what you're doing, but I've noticed it with, with all the people, with other people's feedback as well. They enjoy being around me now. Whereas I used to be a bit like on edge and a bit like grumpy. And I think people like, just look at me now and go like my mates say it, completely different person, but they love the way I am now. They loved me anyway, as because we're, we're mates, but it was always, there's always that that saying, isn't there? You're on eggshells around someone. Yeah. And that was the way people were around me, whereas now I'm I'm completely the opposite. Yeah, that's incredible. And so if you were if you were to sum up, like, because it's like we say, it's about five months. Yeah. If you had to sum up, what was what what did we do? What what were the things that have happened during that time that have changed everything? Uh, I've I've learned to accept things. Uh, accept things that are either out of my control uh, or accept that things happen 
and you, you you can't like well it's the same thing you can't do anything about them uh you can affect certain things in certain ways but um i think one of the biggest things that we did was the was the personalities how many different personalities i don't know whether you want to speak briefly on it but i just found that work incredible and it was i think we'd we'd work for two weeks and i felt so different and we we do one session a week don't we we do every thursday 11 30 i look forward to it probably more than anything in my week um and i i love me work i love playing golf i love seeing i love doing different things but it's the one thing in my week where i feel again content and go i can't wait for it because i'm gonna i'm gonna release another part of me that's gonna make me feel better or help me l- learn to deal with certain scenarios and situations. And um, I think I've just learned to deal with things in a different way and have a, a better acceptance of things. Um, and I think the the more, I think w- the other thing as well is, is learn to, to deal with the things that I'd suppressed. Um, like losing my auntie when I was younger was a huge part of my life. She was like me, like me mum. Uh, my mum used to work nights and I'd spend a lot of time with my aunties and I, and I lost her just after the World Cup and I think my career spiralled after that. Um, didn't know how to deal with it, couldn't cope with it, struggled to talk about her, didn't want to ever talk about her because it just brought up emotions that I didn't want people to see in me. Um, used to make me cry all the time. So what's the best thing to do? Just don't talk about her. I don't want people to see that weakness in me. I don't want people to see uh, see me get upset. Like you can see me now, like while or not. Mm. But um, little things like that, and then obviously learning to deal with the the side of of being getting divorced and things like that. It's like shutting off from that. Uh, how do you how do you deal with that? It's a very difficult time, and and now I'm de- learning to deal with that side of things. It's it's very tough, but now there's an acceptance of it. I, I feel like I'm more equipped to deal with that side of things. Um, the, 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 the situation with my children as well. Um, not seeing them all the time. I was like very hands-on as a, as a, as a dad and would see the kids every single day. And now I'm not seeing them every day, but again, you've got to deal with that. You've got to learn to cope with that. I think I'm better equipped to deal with stuff like that. Um, yeah, life's great. So, uh, it, as as much as people might sit there and go, but you've you've lost so much or whatever, I've gained so much more, and I know that. So how, how do you how just to sort of wrap up a little bit? But how do you feel now? Because look, basically, loads of what we talk about and loads of what I do when you you've touched on it there, going literally going back to childhood, going back to all the stuff we've been taught to suppress and repress over the years, literally decades of. This is how society is built. It's no one's fault. It's something we talk about a lot that we just, this has just been passed down through the generations and we've just spent literally like 40 years yeah. burying all this stuff. And mm. part of what we've done is like bring that all back up and and, yeah, yeah. and release it. Mm. How do you feel now? Because, and this is something I love and I, and especially we've had this conversation, you know, cried in front of each other and, and being upset. And mm. even that, like, imagine that if we'd have met each other five yeah, yeah. years ago and I'd have said, one day, mate, we're going to cry in front of each other. You'd be like, well, no, we're not. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's never going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, and th- just the ability to the thing I was laughing with Dave about, about like just being able to talk about your emotions and your feelings. Yeah, yeah. And I, that was something I, I just didn't, I just wasn't capable of mm. a few years ago. Like it, it's not like I, I even consciously turned it off. I just spent so long burying it yeah. that it wasn't there. Whereas now it, it feels the complete opposite. So how do you feel now, now all these months later compared to how you used to feel? Confident. Um, confident in myself, which is something that I, I hadn't felt for for years. Um, it, it's like a cliche, but do you know when you walk down a street and you just feel 10 foot tall? Like I used to, I used to walk with my head down all the time. I used to like, just keep yourself to yourself. And I'd, I'd amble down the road and now I'm like head up confident. You, you probably, it's quite funny. Like I always laugh to myself when I'm doing it. I walk around town like quite a lot, just wander around, got a bit of time on my hands and I've got my AirPods in and like, I just sing away. And I always see people look at me. I just think, <laughs> I don't care. Like, I don't care what people think about me now. I, 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 obviously I want to, I want people to 
to appreciate what I do. I want people to enjoy what I do, whether that's in work or in my company and things like that. That matters to me in a way because I want people to to enjoy my company and being in and around me. But there's an acceptance of, of also of I don't give a fuck. I really don't give a fuck about certain things now, which would have buried me months ago. Yeah. So if someone had said something to me, like I give you, I, I spoke to you about it. So some, I was in the uh, the Baltic market the other week, um, and I was in a in a bar outside. And some Evertonian came up to me and went, uh, you were a shit left back. And usually I'd have just gone, what the fuck are you speaking to? And I just laughed it off. And I came back to him and just went, oh yeah, terrible, mate. Only play for England and Liverpool and Villa and stuff like that. Only play 500 odd games in my career. Cheers for that. And he just stood there and looked at me and just, oof, I did not say. 20 minutes later, come up and apologise. Sorry for being a dickhead, mate. And I was like, don't worry about it. I'm not bothered. Because it didn't bother me. I was just like, just shut him down in a different way. And Wait, I, how would you have reacted to that years ago? I'd have probably wanted to kill him. I'd have probably got really angry and wanted to have a scrap with him and being like, like I would have been furious because it had hurt me thinking, is that how people see me? Mm. And is that what people all think of me? But it was interesting. Even that same night, um, I was sat there with a group of mates and... Uh, one of my mates was was chatting to him and he, he actually said, have you found it after football? And I actually turned around and went, so I was nearly dead five months ago. And he was like, what? And he was like, are you joking? And he was like, actually, I can tell you're not joking. I was like, no, no. And he was like, so what have you done? And I said, oh, I have therapy once a week. And he was like, wow, that's mad. And I was like, why? And he was like, just how open and honest you are about things. And I was like, yeah, well, that's the way I am now. And that's the the other thing I am. Very open and honest. If you want an opinion on something and you want the truthful opinion, I'll give you my opinion. You might not agree with it, but it's my opinion, and I think it's the right one. Um, and if we if we come to a di- disagreement, well, that's your opinion. Whereas usually I'd have been like, "No, I'm right," and that's all that matters. And and it'd have been confrontational. Whereas I'm a bit like, "Yeah, I get that side of it." So yeah, I, I've changed a lot. Um, but what I've noticed is, is that the core of mates who I had, um, I've all noticed the bet, the, the change for the better and they like the person. Um, and I know as well, even my family, I've said it as well. You're better, so much better for the way you are. I can hear how happy you are like over the phone. Cause I, Sometimes you don't get to see them, but you'll you'll call and have a phone call and they can just tell the enthusiasm in my voice about about everything. Um, but like I say, still have shit days. Still have days where you get frustrated, but they're, they're very few and far between now. And they're not days. They're, they're, they've gone from a few hours down to hours, down to minutes now, down to seconds. And that's the biggest thing I've learned is that is to how to to flip it into seconds and go, it's not so bad. It's not so bad anymore. And that's the biggest thing I've learned. And see your grin as well. <laughs> no, because it makes it. me happy as well to know that I've come that far. Mate, it's 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 incredible and that we're we're coming to the end of our time. We could we could chat all day and we'll carry on chatting yeah. after this. But um it's it's incredible. It's been incredible to watch, and and I, I often now I'm made up now that like this is public because I can talk about yeah, yeah, I can talk about it to other people, and and I've often you know what I said to you at the start, and I said to everybody is that um, this work is your work at the end of the yeah, day. Yeah. Like it's I've I've seen people, and even before I started doing this work, I've seen people who've been seeing therapists for years and years, like proper therapists. That I don't, it's, I don't, I, I'm, it's always intriguing. When, I don't think anyone knows how to talk about the stuff we do no. like I don't even know when people ask me and you've mentioned therapy a couple of times and like it's it's important to say that, you know it's I'm not a qualified therapist this no, is no. this is stuff I've learned and I pass on it's coaching some people think some people call it different things who, who knows what it's called um but it's 
like the work is your work. I always equate it to going to the gym. And I remember saying that yeah, to you yeah. when we started. I said, yeah. look, mate, you will get out of this what you put in. Mm. So I, I can show you the weights and I can tell you how to lift them, but I can't lift them for you. No, You've got to do it. You've got to buy and, into and it. And I always, I say to people now, like your reaction was what I would expect it to be as a Joe, an ex-pro footballer. You were like, I'll smash it. Yeah, yeah. And you did. Like the work you put into it every week, you were like, I've done it. Yeah, I'd be getting emails from me saying, I've done that exercise you gave me. What's next? How do I do this next thing? Threw yourself into it. And that's why you've had the results you've had. And it's it's been a privilege to watch, mate. It really yeah, yeah. has. No, well, I, I think that's the big thing is like anyone who's who's either listening or reads your book or wants help, I think that's the big thing is you've got to commit to it. Um, and that's the big thing. But obviously from my point of view, I've said this to you before, but like I know you've saved me. Otherwise, I'd have been fucked. So, thank you. Mm. Oh. We're gonna we're gonna end with both like in tears. <laughs> I, yeah, I, it's mate. I'm I'm honoured that you would say that, and um, yeah. very it's very humbling to hear that. And I'll I'll put it straight back on you. All, all I've done is is share what I've learned. Yeah, and, yeah, of course. Yeah, like you saved yourself at the end yeah. of the day, and I'm. Yeah. I'm I'm so happy to have seen your development and I made up like I made up to have you in my life to be honest and and like to to watch this continue because I there's nothing more than I love seeing you on TV and messaging you going you look boss there you know? I know yeah like you look know, dead yeah. comfortable and relaxed yeah and... yeah that's no, good yeah awesome mate. Cool. Is, is there anything else you wanted to share before we wrap up no 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 I think uh, I've been as open as I can I think uh, I think the biggest thing is is like for me I think. Uh, I, you you put an Instagram post up, didn't you, the other week? And um, it was about releasing me book. And I put a, a post up just saying this this guy saved my life, which which I've just said then. And it's interesting how many people message me back. Why? What's gone on? Mm. And people don't see it. Um, and that's the big thing is like you you don't know what's going on in people's lives. So if they do need, if you do notice a difference, it's it's very much one of those situations where if you can just speak to them and, and try and help them. Mm. Awesome, mate. Cool. Thank, thank you again for, for having the courage to share all your yeah, stuff. Yeah, no problems. Yeah, good. It's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed that. If anything Steve and I talked about resonated with you, if you would like to know more about the coaching process that I took Steve through, the work that I've done to transform my life and I work with people around the world, helping them to transform theirs, there's two routes you can go down. My new book that we mentioned during the show is being released now. You can get the first four chapters of that book completely free, no strings attached, by going to my website, paul7cope.com forward slash free chapters. You can download the audio or the written versions. If you read them and listen to them and you don't like them, you don't want to hear from me again, you can unsubscribe, no strings at all. If you are interested in one-on-one -on -one coaching, I actually only work with a very few people at any one time. But if you go to the website, paul7cope.com forward slash coaching, you can see the packages that are available. If you've got any questions or you want to get in touch, contact me through the website. I'll answer any questions you've got. I'll let you know if there's any spaces available if you are interested. All of the links to everything I've just said are below the episode. So you can click on them if that's easier. I hope you enjoyed all of that. Take care.